Since the end of the Great War, we have been isolated in the world. While the Anschluss is forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles, the German threat is growing every passing day. Meanwhile, at home, a right-wing populist dictator, Kurt Schuschnigg, has had a hard time to keep our nation afloat. With 20% unemployment and a looming bankruptcy, our economy is the weakest out of our neighbors. And regarding our military, it has been heavily restricted by the Treaty of Saint-Germain-en-Laye. We've only managed to deal with internal socialist and external threats due to the Heimwehr, a nationalistic paramilitary force. But even they are growing tired of Schuschnigg. And we have to agree, so far he has done little and he will probably only lead us to a German Anschluss. So we will support their internal power struggle against him and empower them. To be able to take over power we need to grow our influence over the country. And we can do this through several ways. For example, by drafting a new constitution and implementing changes throughout our nation. We will admit that the Great War was lost by us, unlike Schuschnigg, which believes in the stab in the back myth and forbid elections, both of which are granting us political power. This will be used to hold major Heimwehr parades and ask the Italians for funding, both boosting our influence. In the meantime, Schuschnigg had started to do something about our economy by increasing the austerity measures to bolster the state funds. But unbeknownst to him, a significant portion of these funds had been siphoned away for our own benefit. By starting to patrol the countryside and with our support there growing, we saw our chance to march on Wien and seize power. Surprisingly, Schuschnigg ordered his supporters to stand down, allowing us to take control without bloodshed. However, he still has a lot of influence over Austria and is actively using it to undermine our efforts. But while some argue that we should eliminate him, us Austrians shouldn't fight among ourselves. Especially not as the Nazis are on our borders. So we will try to find common ground with him and his supporters. After a long discussion about the future of Austria, mostly weighing the prospect of Habsburg restoration with the Hohenzoller rule, it was finally decided that we would strive to create a new Germany and restore the German Empire. Us Austrian are undeniably German and we must unify with our brothers, but not under the Nazi flag, we shall be unified by the Hohenzollers. So we proclaimed the Deutsches Kaiserreich and embarked on the journey to reform our country and prepare for the inevitable unification wars. Before we invited the German royal family, we will start to slowly improve our economy. By re-abolishing the medieval guilds, competition between businesses will be encouraged. And by expanding the Großglockner Highway, an important road artery in the Alps, we will not only create new jobs, but also further connect our country. Returning to politics, since announcing our plans for a new German empire, skepticism has arisen among Austrians and high-ranking industrialists. Industrialists, especially Austrian nationalists. So we will begin to lobby support and win over the people by handling the nationalists. Finally, we dared to invite the Hohenzollers, who gladly accepted and arrived in Austria a few days later. Everything is now ready for restoration, the people, our constitution and the state. The only remaining piece is the head of the state. So who should be the fourth Kaiser of the German Empire? Wilhelm II? No, the legacy of the Great War is overshadowing him. How about Wilhelm III? He would maybe modernize things and reform our country. But there is one third third option which has risen in popularity, Victoria Louise, the daughter of Wilhelm II. While many oppose a woman ruling the throne, she represents a new face for a new empire, and has the most potential out of all three. So it is decided we will inaugurate the first Kaiserin in German history. Long live Kaiserin Victoria! Only a few days after getting into power, she had finished the plans to prepare for the liberation of Germany, starting by fixing our economy. By using the aristocratic connections of the Hohenzollers, we could boost state funds and invest into both civilian factories, as well as expanding our hydroelectric capabilities. While we aren't fully ready to end the austerity measures just yet, while we wait for our 16th civilian factory to be built, we can focus on our army and try to fix and expand it. Because due to the Treaty of Saint-Germain-en-Laye, we have been forced 
to rely on only volunteers and even that is heavily restricted. So with the French finally starting to realize we aren't the threat but the Nazis are, we reintroduced conscription and scrapped the treaty without any protest. This new army that we are about to create will be modeled by the highly successful Prussian army, but things will be different of course. With war closing in, the Heimschutzbrigaden will be created to get our citizens engaged as well. But since we still lack manpower to expand our army, we will create the Jugendwehr, a paramilitary organization to get the youth into our army. This meant we could finally start to train new divisions. And even greater news, with our civilian factory count over 15, our Kaiserin announced the end to the austerity measures and our economy finally growing stronger instead of weaker. And that exact same day, the German demand of an Anschluss arrived. We have been caught completely off guard as we expected to have some more time to start rearmament, but we shall not join them just for this. We have already sent diplomats to Poland, Czechoslovakia, France and the UK to improve relations. Therefore we only need to survive 70 days so we can strengthen our relations with monarchies and then form an anti-Nazi front. And while our army only has 150,000 men, we've managed to build forts on our front line with the Germans. Strangely enough, they didn't think we would refuse, so it took about 17 days for them to prepare and declare war. They immediately started attacking, but we managed to comfortably hold them back everywhere except in one tile where they attacked with seven or more divisions. Luckily, we could reinforce it with two divisions and hold them back temporarily. To improve our situation, we also started a small counteroffensive, forcing them to stop attacking from one side. But as we hit the 35-day mark until the creation of the anti-Nazi front, they started to break through. So we were forced to deploy six untrained divisions and send them to the front lines. And with their help, we managed to hold off the German offensive in another 35 days. While they did capture Innsbruck, we did survive until we had reached an agreement with the allies Czechoslovakia and Poland. We promised them German land while they immediately joined the war. The Polish and Czechs started a massive attack and with the Germans not ready at all, they had a hard time stopping them. This meant they couldn't continue attacking us and they were even forced to send away most troops. This allowed us to start two of our own offensives. The first trying to recapture Innsbruck, the other going into Germany. Both were quite slow and we only managed to capture one province in Germany. However, soon our mountaineers had recaptured Innsbruck and could continue into Germany from there. Munich was completely open so we managed to capture Street. Despite being the birthplace of Nazism, most townspeople joined our side, meaning we don't have to garrison the streets. The Nazis tried a counteroffensive that was largely unsuccessful and only allowed us to encircle three of their divisions. In the meantime, the Polish had captured all of Königsberg and Niederschlesen, while Czechoslovakia was slowly advancing everywhere. Back to our front, we started an offensive towards Stuttgart and France. Once again, the German troops were tired and we could break through encircling four divisions in Vorarlberg. Due to it being a mountain, we didn't have the time to capture the division, so we continued. Encircling another division on our way, we soon arrived in the outskirts of Stuttgart. Sadly, the Nazis managed to successfully defend it and we never even arrived to the French border. But this didn't help them much since the Czechs had managed to capture Berlin and the Germans are already 50% toward surrendering. So with renewed morale we restarted our offensive and this time we managed to capture Stuttgart and open the road to the north. After only a few days our mountaineers had captured Frankfurt and together with the Czechs we encircled Nuremberg. But after that, the war stood still. The Germans had recaptured Berlin as well as Frankfurt and the French and British were doing nothing to push the war forwards. Luckily, we have a plan to incentivize the French and after a long fight in southern Württemberg, we had succeeded. We had reached the French border and their troops could finally start to reinforce our as well as the Czechoslovak and Polish fronts. 
With these divisions guarding our backs, we dared to exploit the massive gap in the German front line, recapturing Frankfurt and continuing towards the Rhineland. Soon we had captured Köln and crossed the river, cutting off a big part of the German army which guarded the Siegfried line. Strangely enough, the French had left the Maginot line undefended, so the Germans managed to capture all of Alsace-Lorraine. But this doesn't really matter, with almost a million losses and a big part of their army in circle, the Nazi defenses of northern Germany are weak. So it didn't take long until Dortmund was captured and our forces were marching freely throughout Germany once again. The little resistance we met was encircled and Wilhelmshaven and its two neighboring cities were seized. While the Nazis tried to set up a defensive line outside of Hamburg, it was breached with Allied help and the biggest port city of Germany was captured shortly thereafter. So all that is needed now is one last punch and the Nazis will be knocked out. And our punch was directed towards Berlin. Meeting no resistance, Magdeburg was captured and with the Czechs distracting the German army we could enter Berlin without a fight. The Nazi government immediately surrendered and accepted us as the real German state. But while they transferred all land to us, we won't be able to keep it, since we had agreed with the Allies to make territorial concessions. After a 15-day conference in Vienna, the new borders were drawn. France, Poland, Lithuania and Denmark all got some of our German lands, together with large temporary payments that had to be made to the Czechoslovak and British. However, the price is worth paying. The dawn of a new Germany is here and we can start to rebuild and secure our state. But first, the important question on where our new German capital should be. Wien, Berlin or Frankfurt? With a big battle ongoing between the Berlin and Wien supporters, Victoria decided to move the capital to Frankfurt instead. A new capital for a new Reich. So now the massive work of fixing Germany can start. Firstly, we began to crack down on the Nazi and communist extremists to secure our hold on power. And with their influence slowly diminishing, we could focus on our industry. The reconstruction of our nation was announced, with us starting to focus a lot on investing on civilian industry. But if we want a stronger industry than the Allies and Soviets, we will need to stop the brain drain. The Jugendwehr, which was created before the war, was abolished to encourage young people to pursue education instead of military service. All these efforts together with our great stability, war economy and the civil war being less destructive than it could have been, means that our economy has already been rebuilt and is stronger than ever. This means we can put our focus back on the military, since despite some advocating for a modern democratic empire that seeks to stay peaceful and at good relations with the allies, Victoria has looked to the past and decided to renew the Kaiserreich and reclaim our lands through war. So if we want to succeed, we will need to expand and develop our military as well as our non-existing foreign allies. And to create a new German army, we will need every help we can get, including Nazi Wehrmacht officers which will be rehabilitated. With our civilian industry already strong, we can shift our focus to military industry instead, by subsidizing Mauser, the main producer of our infantry weapons. Just then the Second World War began. The Soviets declared war on Lithuania, a member of the Allies, and Italy attacked Greece, which got help from Romania. The Greeks and Romanians quickly joined the Allies, and so Mussolini and Stalin found themselves in the same side of the war. Continuing with our military expansion, our infantry and mountaineers have already been reformed and are currently being equipped with anti-air guns and artillery. Once we have fully supplied them, we can start to train more of them to reach half a million men, so that we can reform the central powers. Though infantry alone can't win our wars. Fortunately, we have already started to develop panzers and reform our army to center around them. It will take a long time to research and produce them, but by encouraging local tank development and creating a panzer training unit, we will be able to shoot our tank development past the Allied and Soviets. And while we wait for our advanced medium tank chassis to be developed, we can start with broader military reform. 
arms, by reducing the control of the high command and instead putting it on the independent officers. Together with expanded logistics will allow us to adapt to the quick warfare much easier. And to counteract the possibility of allied bombing which will hurt our supply we will invest into armored trains and also railway guns to help our infantry. And for our final army reform for now we expanded the budget of the military academy in Wien greatly improving our research capabilities. Our army is now almost at 1 million deployed men and with our country rebuilt and state secured, it's time to open up our foreign relations and form the Mittelmächte. We immediately invited Bulgaria, the only of our former allies still friendly with us. They gladly joined and that was the only nation we could invite. If we want to continue to expand we will need to do it through conquest. But we aren't really ready for the allies yet. However, However, we can attack Hungary. They are fascists, so the Allies or Soviets won't help them. And if Italy joins their side, we can simply hold them off in the Tiroler Mountains. So with 24 infantry divisions on the border, we declared war with the justification of restoring Habsburg rule. With only three divisions on the border, we could easily enter the country and while they did eventually stop us in the south, we managed to cross the Donau and encircle five Hungarian divisions. After a month of only minor battles, which during our Panzer IV entered production, we were forced to make a strategic retreat due to bad supply and give back much of our captured lands. But they didn't realize that this was a trap and with more supply coming to the north, we could slowly surround Budapest from the east and as we were stopped, we started attacking from the western side and managed not only to encircle it but also split the rest of Hungary in two. So with the Hungarian forces divided in three, it wasn't difficult to capture Budapest and Pex so that they surrendered. After only a few days, Otto von Habsburg was proclaimed leader of the new Hungary and we could turn our forces elsewhere. But we aren't at all ready to attack the Allies. While our army is strong with tanks soon being deployed, our air force and navy are non-existing. While it will be impossible to contest Allied naval and air superiority in the start of the war, we should at least be able to protect our skies and defend our shores. So we will start to research better airframes so we can produce fighters and naval bombers and also initiate our naval rearmament. Due to our limited time and resources we won't be able to invest into researching better ships. So we will settle with old cruisers and two types of destroyers. One for anti-submarine warfare and the other for mines. About 140 days later, as we had constructed several new dockyards, almost researched our first fighter aircrafts and deployed the 10 tank divisions, we decided that it was time to reclaim Germany. With the Allies already outside of Moscow and scared of an intervention from our side, we will hopefully be able to take back a lot of land peacefully. So we proclaimed the Vienna Agreement invalid and claimed all our German states. We started by demanding Schleswig-Holstein from the Danish. Surprisingly, they refused. Since we are more ready than the Allies, we declared war despite the risk of the Danish joining the alliance. With no troops on the border, Hamburg and Kiel were immediately captured and Schleswig-Holstein was once again returned into Germany. As we started to enter Denmark and cross to Odense, the Danish joined the Allies and the whole alliance joined the war against us. We are now almost surrounded on all sides by enemies, but don't worry, we are more than ready.
Eastern states are ours once again. This war was such a big surprise for the Allies that we managed to capitulate both Czechoslovakia and the Polish with only 90,000 casualties. While Lithuania and Romania still exist and are fighting against the Soviets with the fall of Poland, the Allied invasion which had reached Moscow and Leningrad is completely over. Once the last eastern resistance is cleared out, we can turn our mighty army to the west and retake the last parts of Germany. But this is for the next video since Kaiserin Victoria has a lot bigger ambitions than to reunite Germany. Her goal is to orchestrate the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire with all its former landmass and create a colonial empire. So to not miss the upcoming video, subscribe and hit the bell. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next video.